So in 2014, I covered the original Watch Dogs, and I was not particularly kind to it. And with some time and distance, I wondered when I started doing this video if I had been perhaps too cruel. Replaying the opening of the game, I realized... No, no, not at all. Aiden Pierce remains one of the most loathsome protagonists in video game history, which, given video game history, is a pretty remarkable feat. He is an entirely self-centered, abusive jerk who hurts the people around him with indifference, and it only took about an hour of play to get me to hate him all over again. For those who haven't played it, the game opens with you on a quest for revenge that involves torturing a guy for information both physically and mentally. How's your memory now? Then leaving the scene by staging the bodies of some people you and your friend murdered to look like a gang shootout, and then causing a blackout for thousands enjoying a baseball game. The next day, to relieve anxiety, Aiden Pierce casually engages in vigilante justice by killing a guy with a pistol to stop an assault. You won't bother anyone now. And then it's revealed that he was doing this murder instead of attending his only surviving nephew's birthday, and now he was late. Nikki, hey, I know, I know, the party started. It's almost over. Where are you? I'm on my way. Ugh, you make me crazy. He shows up at his sister's to the birthday party of a child that clearly has no friends and an uncaring uncle, and when his sister gets a harassing phone call, he invades her privacy by hacking her phone to listen in and find out who's on the other line but not before stealing some drugs from her bathroom. Once he realizes the call is coming from a nearby car, he leaves his nephew's birthday early, because of course, and chases the culprit downtown until he crashes in a fiery explosive pileup that surely injured countless people other than just the intended target. I'll mention the locks like you said. This is just the first hour of play, and he doesn't ever get better. If anything, he gets worse. Aiden Pierce is a selfish, thieving, murderous villain who ruins the lives of everyone around him, and the game frames him as a noble anti-hero with a cool hat. The fucking Aiden Pierce! And this extends to the game's tone more broadly. I think the intention is to talk about how everyone has secrets they may be ashamed of and don't want to get out, but the first CTOS machine you hack gets access to secrets like... A guy that sounds like he's gonna kill his wife, maybe? You are an ugly bitch. You nasty piece of shit. You ruined my life. You nasty piece of shit. And now I am gonna cut your throat and put your head in a spice cabinet. And... Hi, yeah, yeah, sweetheart. Don't worry, my love. Everything's fine. You go back to sleep, okay? Okay, I love you. Yeah, I love you too. Or it lets you overhear conversations and read texts between people cheating on one another or making super crass jokes. So she's sitting next to me, right? She's pulling my hand between her legs. No way! <laughs> of course, there I am, hard as a fucking post. So she's got one hand in my pants, and man, it is a nice grip. It comes across less as everyone has private information that they don't want to get out, and more like... Everyone's kind of an asshole, so it's fine that Aiden Pierce is king of the assholes. It's... it's not great. And I feel like Ubisoft was receptive to this, because Watch Dogs 2 feels like an attempt to pivot hard away from it. It dropped Aiden Pierce as its protagonist in favor of Marcus Holloway, a hacker engaged in activism against the huge monolithic Bloom Corporation, the company behind the CTOS monitoring software. And to achieve those activist ends, he teams up with the San Francisco chapter of DedSec. Now, DedSec was sort of an ambivalent force in the original Watch Dogs. It was an anarchic amalgam of Anonymous and other hacktivist groups that basically just did things for the lulls. They occasionally helped Aiden Pierce, but really they were just interested in gaining access to systems and juicy secrets however they could towards mostly morally ambiguous ends. Watch Dogs 2 reframes the organization to be full-on good guys. DedSec are now hacktivists with a worldview and an ethos about helping people rather than just wanting access to hacks, data, and useful information. They want to take down Bloom because CTOS is using flawed algorithms to do predictive policing, among other horrible crimes. Hey, where have I seen that idea used but framed as a good thing before? Oh, right. But the nihilistic tone that seemed to just hate people and love revenge is gone, and replaced with a hopeful team that pushes for change that benefits all. And the color palette is more vibrant. San Francisco has a bunch of bright and shiny days where Chicago felt very brown and gray and 2008-y. 
And finally, the characters feel like an intentional move away from Aiden Pierce. Instead of the embodiment of angry white boy rage in a $2,500 leather trench coat, we get a cast of characters that, while a little one note, feel relatable and motivated. We get little summaries of what radicalized them into DedSec, and what their personal beef with Bloom is, and how they prefer to operate as hacktivists. See, Josh, he's high-functioning autistic, which means he's got a very specific way of talking. We got to look at a CTOS profile and all kinds of nasty flags popped up. Emotionally challenged, unstable, even a low mental maturity score. He's none of those things and he quickly became the activist soul of our group. We caught a glimpse of the damage CTOS dealt him. Rejected care programs, cut funding, overcharges. We offered to help him make things right. When we met Josh, he had the right intentions and the wrong approach, like a laser putting on a pretty light show instead of burning holes. If Bloom's system wants to make him unemployable, damn straight we're gonna snatch him up and point him right back at him. And we get dialogue between them that involves them bouncing their personalities off of one another in a way that makes them feel like a cohesive group. Sure you configured it properly? Dude, I don't question you about crypto shit, do I? Guys, shut up. I'm in. It also allowed us to have an antagonist whose actions felt, well, villainous. He knew how to hit Marcus where it hurt, doubling down on his unearned police record. The feud was ideological, sure, but it was also personal. I had to meet you, and there you were, pissing on your sneakers. All brains and no aim. What's Bloom's CTO doing in the office of the CEO of Invite? And why'd you boost our numbers? Uh, this is the part where you offer me a six-figure salary? <laughs> no, fuck no. No, no, no. You could coat circles around most of my programmers. No, see, I can't pitch uh, CTOS 2.0 as a state-of-the-art security system and then hire someone that's on the no-fly list. It's not layered, deep character work, but it was a major step forward from the contemptible Aiden Pierce. All of this adds up to a game series moving away from its angry, toxic roots by focusing on characters that had enough internal life and empathy towards one another that you could care about them individually and as a team. Have you seen the trailer for the new Jimmy Siska movie? No, it's out. Hey, hey, pull it up, no, man. No, no, not on this. For this, we need perfect sound. We need a big screen. We need to be comfy. We need quiet. Have you seen it yet? No, man. I waited for you. You're the best. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're going to watch the trailer. Shut the fuck up. Shut up. Which brings us to the release of 2020's Watch Dogs Legion. In Watch Dogs Legion, you play as, effectively, DedSec itself. Not a single protagonist or individual character, but the entire London division of DedSec. To do this, you can conscript more or less anyone in the game world to the cause, from unexpected characters like janitors and old ladies, to video game staples like assassins and secret agents. The world is littered with potential playable characters. You simply need to look at a person, and a hacked CTOS system will pull up a list of personality traits. These can be good or bad. An elderly person may have difficulty with mobility, or someone may have access to their own car or firearm. Maybe they're prone to flatulence and thus are likely to get detected by enemies during stealth, or maybe they have enough hacking knowledge to steal digital key codes from an unlimited distance away. Approach them and they'll have a recruitment mission for you to complete. Finish it and they're a permanent member of your team. Or, well, until they die. In Watch Dogs Legion, you don't play as an insufferable 35-year-old or an idealistic 20-something kid. You play as whoever you want. It's a bold choice that surely presented all sorts of production woes and the need for a bevy of new game systems. But it's also a choice that is... a bit befuddling, honestly. Having just released a sequel that seemed to squarely address most of the complaints about its protagonists to a largely positive reception, Ubisoft is again upending its entire approach to who is at the center of a Watch Dogs game. In place of characters with their own quirks and personalities that come through with their character design, writing, and performances, we now have procedurally generated characters arrived at algorithmically. You get me that file and I'll get back everything from those pricks. Help me with this and I'll make it worth your while, if you know what I mean. Help me with this, and I'll make it worth your while, if you know what I mean. All right, we'll look into it. And since it's kind of the defining trait of Watch Dogs Legion, I think it's worth looking at the play as anyone system and what the game gets out of it. Because it's not clear to me, given the final product, what the play as anybody system is really trying to accomplish. The initial immediate impression, given the prevalence of each character's skill set in the UI, is that you're effectively choosing a loadout that plays fundamentally different than any other character. 
My mind immediately went to Prey Moon Crash, a game where multiple characters each have different abilities that forces you to rethink how you engage with the challenges the game world puts in front of you. And indeed, that's what the game's creative director Clint Hawking seems to imply in this E3 interview. You know, by being able to explore the design edges of that space, this character can do this, but they, you know, they can't do that, or this character has this class, or that other character has these perks. It gives you all these different builds, all these different ways to play the game, uh, and also all these different identities that you can explore and play with and be. But the level and game design both feel at odds with that goal. Story missions in particular suffer from this. They tend to be big scripted sequences with only one solution, which is fine, I guess, but it kind of negates the whole idea of having these different people with different abilities. So, for example, you may be forced to fly a drone with a light in front of you to see the path you need to follow, or use a spider bot to sneak into some area and hack some equipment. It doesn't matter if the character has these things equipped going into the mission. Anytime you need a spider bot or construction drone, they're nearby. You'll be using Sebastian and the rest of the microdrones to bypass security. But first you'll have to get by that laser array. I suggest a spider bot and steady nerves. On it. Every once in a while you'll reach a story mission that really feels like it encapsulates the immersive sim style problem solving that the play as anyone system seems to be reaching for. Like breaking into the stadium, which can be done any number of ways, from stealth to a full frontal assault. I flew in over the walls on a construction drone. But those find a solution to this problem highlights are few and far in between, and even when they show up, tend to just be a choice between stealth, combat, spider bots, and cargo drones. Meanwhile, equipment upgrades happen for all team members, not individual characters. Granted, each character can only have one piece of equipment on them at once, but this can be changed any time outside of a mission, so it's not tied to the character, really. It's a player choice thing about preferring to use spider bots or electro fists or stealthy cloaks or whatever. And having that kind of equipment, a cloak or a close range melee attack or an EMP mine or a spider bot, all have way more impact on playstyle than the more subdued character perks. If your chosen equipment is a cloak, you'll be playing fundamentally differently than if your chosen equipment is a knockout punch, regardless of whether your character has flatulence or earns extra money from missions. The subdued nature of perks and the ability of anyone to wield any equipment results in a game where some characters find it easier to do some things than others, but no character finds it impossible to do anything. Like anyone can hack cargo drones or summon them from a drone landing pad. Construction characters just have the ability to spawn them instantly out of thin air at a moment's notice. It makes the use of cargo drones more convenient for construction characters, but it doesn't mean recruiting a construction character fundamentally opens up new play possibilities that you didn't have before. And it's the same for all of the game's systems. Any character can parkour to one degree or another, any character can hack to one degree or another, and any character can do stealth to one degree or another. Armed combat is also always an option. It's just that each character has modifiers that may make it easier or harder to do those things. Low mobility characters might have a slightly harder time in combat because they can't move as fast or take cover, for example, or a character who gets faster cooldown times on hacks might have a marginally easier time in stealth sections. But a low mobility old man can absolutely shoot his way out of a situation, and a hacker can absolutely end up needing to break into places physically despite his systems knowledge. At the end of the day, they're all Ubisoft open world protagonists. So you don't end up with a rich, interesting possibility space of different characters that range from stealthy ninjas to expert hackers who can do everything from their bedroom to skilled combatants that are experts in combat to regular people just trying to help out, all set in a game designed to facilitate multiple play styles at once. You end up with a flat Ubisoft style action stealth open world game that just kind of warps a little depending on who you're playing as. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to do stealth, or a little bit easier to shoot a bunch of bad guys, but anyone can do stealth and anyone can shoot bad guys. This undercuts the whole play as anyone system because from a gameplay perspective, the choice doesn't matter all that much. It feels like one of the core design decisions was that every mission can be beaten by any character, so if you want to beat the whole game as a gun-toting granny, executive banker, or cyberpunk teen, you absolutely can. Which is, in some sense, really cool. Every character can be the hero of this story. And again, that's an impressive feat, and I don't want to undersell that. But the decision to let anyone be the hero all of the time is one that favors player empowerment and expression, but at the expense of having a system that feels meaningfully impactful. In a system where everyone can do everything, more or less, no one feels memorable. 
And I hate saying that because it sounds like some Brad Bird, John Galt nonsense about wanting great characters to be unchained to achieve their fullest potential. But I'm not looking for great abilities, just different abilities. If you're going to present choosing who to recruit as a core mechanic of the game, if you're going to make that choice a focus, I want to be able to feel the consequences of that choice. But if it's not really beneficial in a game system sense, maybe there's something else to the play as any one thing. Maybe it's less of a gameplay device and more of a storytelling one, a means of procedurally generating a narrative. And that's awesome. Plenty of games have personalized, memorable narratives from The Sims to Rogue to Spelunky. Everyone has their favorite stories from playing these games that are wholly their own. And it's clear that the game has been taking notes from the Shadow of Mordor series. It applies certain relationships between procedurally generated characters that will appear again and again in order to deepen your relationship with what would otherwise be a forgettable NPC. For example, the game has a handful of Albion enforcers, the bad guys in the game, that it will use throughout your adventures. And if they get injured too violently or too often by your characters, they'll develop a hatred for DeadSec. Which, cool, we now have an enemy, a nemesis. And this can later manifest in them kidnapping one of your operatives off screen, forcing you to complete a mission to get them back. Here's something fun. I was doing one of my routine head counts and it turns out one of you is completely unaccounted for, probably kidnapped. I'm reconstructing their CTOS data now and it looks like they were being trailed by an enemy of ours right before they were kidnapped. A woman who you managed to piss off during your escapades. Find her and she'll lead us to our operative and they may keep reappearing until you kill them, at which point they stay dead. And hey, that's a whole little emergent narrative right there. Or you may see a little marker under a person's name being harassed by Albion forces, someone who is related to an operative or a prospective candidate in your group. Stopping that harassment will help their relative's opinion of DedSec and potentially get them to be recruitable. Other times they may have a blackmailer that you can take out to help convince them to sign up, or some legal snafu that you can erase by breaking into a CTOS station and wiping their records. And these little generative stories are, indeed, pretty cool the first time you encounter them. The problem is that they're rote experiences. It turns out that lots of people in London seem to have blackmailers or problems with police reports that need to be erased. And the third or fourth time one of your compatriots gets kidnapped by someone who hates DedSec, you'll just sigh in frustration. It's also hard to keep track of who is who in a game with dozens of characters. When you see someone on the street and the UI insists they're the relative of Daniel Smith or whatever, you won't know off the top of your head who that is, and there's no easy way to cross-reference it other than going down the list of all operatives and potential recruits one by one. And this proc-gen story stuff feels like it's a consequence of simulating every Londoner, but not an intended side effect of the play-as-anyone system, and they don't actually play well together. Like, the benefit of Shadow of Mordor is that Talion has a personal relationship with these orcs he keeps running into. Sometimes they best him, sometimes he bests them, they level up and get more powerful, but so does he, etc. There's a story there, a history. I killed you before. You came back and threatened me. And now look where you lie. <laughs> Still full of shrock, I see. But when you can play as anyone, that sense of personalized rivalry goes away. The Albion officer who you've beat up three times doesn't hate Susan, the DedSec operative who hurt her most recently. She hates DedSec in the abstract. But Albion already hates DedSec in the abstract. It doesn't personalize the threat or make the story more interesting. Because you're playing as a team and not an individual, that relationship doesn't feel personal. And unlike Shadow of Mordor, where the hero orcs have a variety of stats that fundamentally change combat encounters so that fighting them is memorable, the Albion agent angry at DedSec is just another Albion employee who goes down just as easily. Consequently, it doesn't feel like it's generating a personalized narrative between one of your operatives and her, so much as it's another excuse to generate open-world busywork where you have to save one of your kidnapped operatives. It generates quests, not narratives, and that's kind of a bummer. There's also the fact that procedurally generated characters just don't really work. It's like a Twitter bot. One out of every 20 or 50 or 100 outputs may be perfect or amusing or hilarious, but the bulk are just trash. For example, while getting pickup footage for this episode, I ran into this man ranting to himself about revenge in front of an ATM late at night. Oh, I can't yeah. fucking wait to get my revenge. No. It turns out he's the youngest, least well-paid paleontologist ever at just 19 years old and earning 13 grand a year. 
He also wakes up at 4 a.m. every morning to go commit vandalism and is currently investigating a counterfeit drug trade. He also might just not be that bright. Compare this character to Wrench from Watch Dogs 2, who loved bad movies and had anger management and trust issues, but was a fierce and loyal friend. We don't know Wrench's income or search history or hourly schedule, but we don't need to. We get to know him, not some data abstraction of him. It kind of feels like Watch Dogs Legion fell backwards into the trap of its own cyber police state premise. It's doing the opposite of what Silicon Valley is doing in the real world. Instead of boiling real human beings down to a handful of data points, they're starting with a handful of procedurally generated data points and working backwards to say that they've built a whole person. And that alchemy just doesn't work in either direction. The algorithm isn't capable of authoring people, but just a handful of gameplay stats derived from pre-made labels like opera singer or assassin or software engineer. It's hard to care about your teammates when they amount to a procedurally generated list of attributes, and harder still to care about the uncle of a procedurally generated list of stats. This flat forgettableness also extends to the voice work. Now, it's undeniably impressive that they charted out their game script so well that it can scale depending on which voices are available on your team and how many people are on your team. Move one more muscle chief and I'll blow the whole place with you in it. All right, let's not get dramatic. Who the fuck are you? And what are you doing in my flat? You with Albion? Ouch. Think more countercultural. What, dead sick? It works for in-game cutscenes, incidental dialogue while driving around, and procedurally generated missions. All of this is, it must be stated, an incredible feat of production in and of itself. She's scared. There's no other reason for her to threaten us. Good. She should be scared. Send me the coordinates. Like, no joke, being able to do that is hard. But because any character can interact with any bit of dialogue, you get a lot of weirdly stilted conversations. Like, listen to the naturalistic back and forth you get in this bit of dialogue from Watch Dogs 2, where Marcus is trying to convince Satara to not quit. I'm trying to have a good time. Me too. So we, as in DedSec we, are gonna enter that hacking challenge and we're gonna win. And the others are okay with this? They will be. I got a nice smile. Well, you do have a nice smile. <laughs> See? No problem. We're gonna do this. Everything's gonna be okay. You got it all figured out, huh? Nah, but I do know if I get you back in Satara mode, you'll figure out most of it for me. <laughs> Damn, you are dangerous. <laughs> Meet us by the ugly sculpture when you're ready. All right, see you there. Then listen to this recruitment conversation. It's about time someone stands up and does something for this city, don't you think? You're with DedSec? Would you help me destroy my magnum opus, please? Excuse me? Well, I worked in a pharmaceutical lab until my supervisor sold my research to Albion and fired me. I've heard they're running top secret tests in their own military lab now. God knows what file business they're getting up to. Could you destroy my old files? I'll tell you everything I know. All right, we look into it. Thank you, dear. I never forget a favor. Help me and I'll help you however I can. Again, it's impressive that any characters can have any conversation, but the conversations themselves are awkward and soulless exchanges. Formalities that establish, yes, I have given you a mission, or thank you for completing my mission. And they sidestep this rigidness in mission cutscenes by having everyone just sit on a couch, watch a video from the unrecruitable plot characters, and then give one-liners about, that's horrible. Malik probably worked out the same thing. Yeah, we've been thinking about this subject. Tell them, Bugley. They come off as game show contestants being given a task by the charismatic host, and they're about as deep and disposable. The point is, the Play as Anyone system is part of an overall effort by Watch Dogs Legion to swing for procedural narrative in multiple ways, by generating events and relationships with other characters to respond to, or generating characters for people to play as. But the problem is that the narratives it generates are flat and static. None of the structures or characters or relationships between them change. The game just adds little labels to characters to present the illusion of higher personalized stakes in the context of gameplay that is already there. And putting a little, they particularly hate you message under bad guys, or they're your potential recruits father's uncle's college roommate tags under people being harassed by Albion, don't generate new narratives by simply being there. To be meaningful, those tags need to integrate with game systems in a way that players care about and feel, and they're not. That's not a ludocentric systems first, the mechanics are all that matter statement. I keep comparing the game to Watch Dogs 2 because that game exuded a warmth and emotional core that's lacking here. Well, I will get this little fucker prepped while you go get us some caffeine. Uh, wait, you want me to get you two coffee? No, he's a robot. I want you to get us caffeine. 
He'll take a decaf. So I'm not saying game narratives need to be systems driven, I'm saying if you're going to step away from traditional authored stories to focus on procedural narrative, you need to figure out how to make those procedural narratives compelling. Watch Dogs Legion doesn't. I'm So the Play as Anyone concept doesn't really offer a ton of interesting gameplay changes, and it doesn't really successfully generate procedural narratives. But there is one unique-ish way I found myself interacting with the Play as Anyone system, and I can't tell how much of the game itself deserves credit for it. And that is... as a springboard for role-playing. Role-playing is always an act of shared, collective storytelling, usually between multiple people, but occasionally between just a player and an absent game designer via a role-playing system or book. And we can get into conversations about whether single-player role-playing is a masturbatory exercise or not, but at what point does a player projecting meaning onto procedurally generated characters become headcanon and fanfiction, rather than something the text and the player are working together to generate? How hands-off can a game be before the player is doing all of the work? For example, I had a dead sec agent whose day job profession was comedian, and who owned a car, but when I played as him I liked to steal other people's cars because, in my head, I thought that he thought it was funny. A guy who owns a car in downtown London but used his membership to a hacktivist group as an excuse to hotwire motorcycles rather than remember where his keys are. It was a bad running gag, like the wet bandits leaving sinks running in every house they hit, and it underscored why he was a failed comedian come hacktivist. She cool motorcycle. But it's a running gag almost exclusively extra textual to the game. The only thing the game provided was that his job was a comedian, so he probably liked a good joke, and that he did in fact own a car I could summon at any point, but I chose not to. Is this role playing and character building entirely of my own creation, or is it something the game and I worked together to build given that the game doesn't actually recognize it? And it's not like while playing Watch Dogs Legion I just came up with one-off character gimmicks. For the first third of the game or so, my main character was Christopher Butler, a dapper opera singer with an upper crust accent. He didn't do every mission, but he was, in my head, the backbone of the team, responsible for recruitment and tactical planning. Until he died tragically when I got a little bit messy. This left the team in a bit of a lurch. But along the way, the team had hired Carmen Chioka a waitress we just happened to bump into while she was bussing tables. She was already sympathetic to the cause, with family being up for deportation, and we recruited her easily. She didn't have a ton of interesting skills other than a non-lethal tranquilizer, but she slowly transformed her entire life into being a dead sec operative. She started dressing differently, and she was good at it. And when Christopher died, it was she that took over. She was the one that brought down billionaire Sky Larson and had a hand in every other major operation we undertook. I watched her grow from a lady begrudgingly wiping down a table to make ends meet to the head of an organization that embodied her fight against inhuman deportations. But, and this is important, none of that is in the game. That's my headcanon, effectively. What the game provided was her original job as a waitress, the ability to change her clothes, the permadeath of Christopher Butler, and a background detail of a family member being deported that she was actively fighting against. And that does paint a picture of a woman who would fight for DedSec, but the internal team dynamics and her growth as a character, that she fell into the work of fighting Albion obsessively, that she quit her day job that she hated, that she felt like she'd finally found her calling and family, that she totally changed her style to reflect this newfound self, and that she was the one that took over once Christopher Butler died. That all came from me. It effectively does not exist in the text. At all. The game does not recognize it. The game does not care. And I'm torn on this, because it comes back to some fundamental questions about single-player role-playing. On one hand, the game does open the possibility for creating your own unique, dynamic narratives. Compared to, that person who hates you has kidnapped a random one of your members again, Carmen's growth was compelling. The death of Christopher Butler was compelling, because DedSec had to figure out who, if anyone, would take his place as leader. But how much should the game systems be doing to reflect those stories? Because the more the game formalizes stories, the more constrained the possibility space is. There's no actual leadership role in the game, there's no difference between a casual and hardcore DedSec member, and there's no internal life to characters other than a list of factoids. And it's exactly the absence of formal systems that recognize that stuff that let me come up with a story where there wasn't one. If they did have internal systems, I'd be constrained to whatever stories those systems were designed to tell. 
in the same way that the people who hate DedSec just become recurring kidnappers. But the less the game facilitates reflecting those stories in the game space, the more it's just kind of some made-up fanfiction I've written about my own playthrough. I feel like there's an equilibrium to be found between giving players systems-free, blue-sky expressive spaces that have no limits on them, and shoving them down a handful of prepackaged narrative paths like the generative missions do. Reflecting player expression in ways that make it feel like the game is collaborating with players to tell a story is critical for role-playing, especially single-player role-playing. Ultimately, I feel like Watch Dogs Legion's play-as-anyone system can provide prompts, but players do the rest. I take the death of Christopher Butler and turn it into a power vacuum. I take a woman waiting tables, change her clothes, and call her a leader. I take a comedian with a car and invent a stupid joke he tells. Watch Dogs Legion's Play As Anyone system is great at giving me role-playing prompts, but it fails as a role-playing system because it can't respond to the role-playing act itself. It throws me some action figures, gives me a back-of-the-box blurb for each of them, and then says, I don't know, figure something out. It invites role-playing, but it is not itself a role-playing game. Ultimately, it's hard not to marvel at the boldness of Watchdog Legion's play-as-anyone system, but it ends up feeling like it's pulled in too many directions at once to succeed. If it was a more systems-focused game, it could have made player selection a meaningful mechanical choice or trade-off. Again, Prey and Moon Crash is probably my high watermark for doing this kind of thing really well. It can be done, but it requires designing levels for it and being comfortable telling players no, which this game refuses to do. If it was interested in generative stories, it needed to figure out ways to make those stories personal and core to the experience, rather than incidental and about other characters in the game world. Above all, make the generative stories about the people you've recruited and spent time with, rather than the strangers you've yet to recruit. Who cares if Susan, who works for Albion, hates DedSec? All of Albion hates DedSec. But if Christopher Butler was losing faith in the cause, that'd be an interesting challenge. And if the play as anyone system wanted to facilitate role-playing, it needed to have more means of reflecting the stories players are telling to themselves. Any one of these would be noble goals, and a reason enough to keep this system around. But as implemented, it's kind of a tepid toe dip into each of them. And that sucks, because I'd love to see something like this tried again, just with more focus. An open world game where you can play as anyone, each of whom have fundamentally different play styles and abilities, requiring you to build a team to achieve your goals. An open world game built around generative narratives, where your relationship with the individuals in the city, and even whole districts, depends on your choices. A cyberpunk role-playing game about leading a team of vigilante hackers against the worst of a sprawling metropolis. Well, we'll see about that last one, I guess. But any of those could theoretically be great. And a big tentpole game taking a stab at these kinds of things isn't a bad thing. But a big tentpole game also has to satisfy a lot of other interests, which limits the ability to really push these sorts of experimental, forward-looking designs. Play as anyone fails, but it doesn't fail because the idea that anyone can be a hero is bad, or that games taking a more humanistic approach to their systems is bad. It fails because it's unsure how it wants to use its protagonists to tell its story. And really, that feels like a microcosm of the entire franchise at this point. 